to Two Guys and Some Horror. Today, uh, as one of your hosts, Clark, I'm here to introduce a wonderful person who uh, you may or may not be familiar with. His name is Curtis. He's also one of the hosts of the show. Curtis, how are you doing today? Pretty good, Clark. How are you doing today, bud? Oh, man. You know, it's it's fantastic. Uh, and the, the climate we're in right now is probably one of the most friendly, open, like everybody kind of meeting new people, getting really close and a personal uh, you know, it's it's a very uh, joining time. I uh, very social. I'm very confused by very what you're distant, talking about. <laughs> very distant socialization. I'm talking about how right now there's a pandemic going on, and most of us are kind of locked in our houses. So we're, you know, I'm sure there's there's a little bit of antsiness, a little bit kind of oh, I'm discovering new things because I'm bored going on here so uh how's that how's that kind of been for you man yeah i um i agree you know it's we're on two and a half weeks almost coming up uh for me personally three weeks i think being home right. uh from work and this week we finally started back with like some of the distance learning stuff that they're uh pushing out and mm. yeah so it's it's just been interesting trying to get work done and trying to uh also help my daughter uh with any of her schoolwork and then my wife is a teacher so she's having to help her class kids and then also our daughter uh so that way i can have some focus downtime on on my work has been very fun juggling those things yeah no you're you're doing a great job and you can you kind of like in lieu of speaking of getting to work uh, today we we watched uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Well, I shouldn't. Maybe not today, but we both watched Nightmare on Elm Street too. Uh, Curtis, could I get your just like a brief opinion on this movie? Because when I first heard about this film, I heard it was kind of the black sheep of the Nightmare on Elm Street flicks, and and I didn't really understand that. And my what my perception was was like this was one of the worst ones, and then I actually watched it, and now I'm just kind of. Confused. I want to. I want to hear what you have to say, though, before I jump into that. Sure. So, I've always watched the Nightmare on Elm Street series in its chronological order. Um, Nightmare on Elm, on Elm Street Two has always stuck out to me as just different, um, and I can never really pick out why. All throughout, like my childhood, growing up, those kinds of things, trying to just figure out like what what's so different about this one? Why does it feel so different? And then as I got older um, and started talking with more people in the horror um fandom i started to realize there's a lot more going on in this movie than most people are aware of um for instance um you have a male hero in this film and that's this is the only film that actually has that aspect in all of the franchise um all the other films are the majority of them are all the same character uh well yes and no yeah i mean <clears throat> they're all female um but um, it, it does change up. Like Nancy moves away from being the main character um, after I think it's three. So in four, you get a new character who's the main. Um, and then later on in the series, you have the dream child who's, uh, you know, the main character. But then even later on in Freddy's New Nightmare, you bring back Nancy, played by uh, Heather Lagen Lagenkamp. So... Specifically, this film just goes a whole different route where two things. So one, it's the male um, hero. And then two, this is the only uh, you know film in the franchise that Freddy actually kills people outside of their dreams. He's not um, just killing them in the dream world. He's actually coming out by possession through Jesse and mm. killing people in the real world. So I think those two big like things that. stood out to me for sure. Um but then obviously there's the one that you can find just by Googling a Nightmare on M Street 2. Um, you know, some of the top hits on the internet are, are going to talk about its homoerotic undertones, which I think is what you're more or less alluding to. I, well, not, not at the start. I just, like, I do want to talk about that too. Because, but, you know, this movie came out in 1985. It, it they like, with a $3 million budget, and it grossed about... Well, opening weekend was about two point nine million, but the overall they made about thirty. So not a bad, not a bad box office 
box office movie, and it really kind of showcased why they made so many with the amount of money they made off just Freddy Krueger in general. But well, well, the story, I, the story behind New Line and why uh, Freddy is such a household name now is really interesting because New Line didn't have a ton of money. Um, in fact, when they made the first Freddy film, they were working out of the, um, you know, the owner of New Line's uh, car. Everything he had, it was in his car, him and his wife. And basically, they, they built New Line Cinema from the ground up outside of this vehicle. So um, the minute that the slasher kind of, the slasher movie kind of exploded, because it was Michael Myers in 79, then you had Jason in the early 80s. Um, and Friday the 13th, you had, you know, the first, the second, and then New Line was like, well, we, we, we got to get in on this. We got to capitalize now. And then that, that really helped build New Line and New Line was really only known for the Nightmare on Elm Street series for a long time. Yeah, no, it's it definitely showcased like that. This movie had a lot of heart. It looks like they put some effort into it. They put some soul into it. The acting was, I would say it's par part of the course for a horror movie, if not good for a slasher flick. Um, like there are a couple characters. There's, there's, there were a couple situations that were a little goofy and hammy, like just because the delivery wasn't great, but otherwise this, this film was, was perfect. I, I loved it. Uh, I kind of, with the gay tone thing, I'm not, I'm not certain about it. I understand like there, there's like imagery. There's, there's things about this movie. I, I don't. I'm not certain, like what the director was trying to portray here. With that, I can see the main character as being gay, but I like we have like the best friend character who kind of plays a romantic interest. If you're, if you're looking at the things that way, and then you have his friend, who may be a romantic interest if you're looking at it that way, and I don't know. So, just to clear a few things up. Um, the director wasn't the one who had really anything to do with the, the gay undertones. Um, it was primarily the writer. And the writer uh, did it unbeknownst to pretty much anybody else. Um, and he's come out and said in articles afterwards as such. Um, now, whether or not he meant for Jesse to be this fully struggling with being a homosexual and coming out and all of that, he hasn't gone into detail about exactly what he was trying to portray. But he has he has said in an interview, <laughs> basically, um, if you didn't pick up on the gay undertones throughout this film, then you are severely misleading yourself. And and maybe you need to ask yourself some questions about um, what what uh, homosexuality is to you or you know he, he's just basically put it back on the viewer of like well do you just think that you know gay people don't exist do you just think this isn't a gay thing uh, which i always find uh, it was the never sleep again series um which is all up on youtube somehow um but i know i watched it probably at one midnight sitting just trying to look for different articles or interviews on Nightmare on M Street, and that was one of the ones that popped up and was really fun I'm, to watch. I'm, I'm still confused at the, the gay undertones like thing. Like, I still don't understand where he was trying to portray it or with what. Like, it, and if he's just kind of saying this right now, or if this was actually his intention. Yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, it's always on that because there's because without the oh, let me finish. Without yeah. the actors actually showcasing. The, like th there's a lot of delivery that's involved that makes it look that way, mm -hmm. especially with the main character himself kind of show like without his the way he's kind of his acting makes you would make you think that. But without him kind of doing that, most of his lines don't feel homosexual. They just don't. So I'm, I'm still I'm still lost here if that's I'm, the writer. I mean, I've got so I've got a list of things um, just compiled from. Me watching it last night uh, and yeah. a few different articles that were written um, that you can find online about yeah. what other people um, who are gay found in the movie to be very much so what mm. they think is gay undertones throughout the whole thing. Um, but the one that like the biggest thing to me that just seals the deal um, 
is the fact that the writer has come out and said it, right? That's a pretty big mm-hmm. thing. The actor so that who played him taking mm-hmm. taking kind of uh, credit for something he actually didn't originally intend, and he's just yep. like, "Oh yeah, of course, yeah, it's obvious." Agreed. Um, but then the actor Jesse, the guy actor who plays Jesse, um, has come out since to be a homosexual and has okay. also said that in filming this movie with uh, Robert England, there were moments mm-hmm. when he felt that it was being too sexualized, that they were doing things that were too, uh, just too much and would hurt his career. For instance, maybe they and were. This, and this is my favorite interview so far that I've read was that Jesse. Uh, when Jesse first meets Freddy in his dreams, Freddy takes the glove and is kind of playing with Jesse's mouth around his lips with his knife and glove, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the actor who plays Jesse actually has come out and said, like, hey, during this scene, when we're filming the scene, uh, Robert England actually asked me if he could stick the knife in my mouth back and forth. And when I looked, and, and this is Jesse, he said, when I looked over to... Um, whoever the director was, uh, he asked him, he's like, is this, is that too much? And the director said, I think it would hurt your um, career. If you let this happen, don't do this. So then Jesse said, okay, you know, that's too much. Don't do that. So he just let him play around his lips. Now, once again, these are all, everything is all like interviews and I don't know, it's kind of hard because it's all after the fact, right? So yeah, they could totally just be reaping in today's day and age. I th- the actor was the one that showcased it to me. It wasn't the script, so I'm I'm still. Yeah, see, I think it was a lot this. more than just the acting because you have props put in, you have multiple. You're writing talking about lines, there's a sign that says "No girls allowed." A game that says but that "Pro." Really... You have. Uh, multiple different lines that like, are delivered that are just... There's a game called Probe, yeah, yeah, which Probe doesn't necessarily have homosexual or sexual connotations, especially back in the 80s, as far as I understand. You have a guy like, who's struggling with kinda... his inability to have sex with his girlfriend. You have... I mean, you... And then he runs to his okay. best friend's room and literally screams out... Uh, <laughs> There's someone I trying mean, that, to get inside my that, body. It, it, it looked like they were both kind of into that to me. And while the actor may not have been, like, it's... I it, the, the script itself definitely tried to showcase them as a romantic partnership, as a couple. Yeah, I guess like, that that's my point pushed. is, um, to me, the writing is what is defining the gay undertones, not just, uh, you know, Jesse or Patton's I just um, said the acting. opposite, but yeah. So we're not going to agree on this for sure. I don't think so. I, yeah. I think this is a. I, I think it's just a theory. I think it's. I think there's something people see here. I don't believe the writer, and I. I this is kind of me just nitpicking here. But, like, sure, I. You can. You could see things like this. This movie had a lot of interesting little. I would say racist in some cases, like props, like the Fu Manchu cereal. Yeah, I don't see that as racist at all. The Fu Manchus? Yeah, it was it was just a box of cereal that they needed. That was a little racist. In order to get the finger prop. With a racial stereotype. Oh yeah, that that, that did that makes sense. The whole but still calling them Fu Manchus is a little. I mean, if it's racist, I I, I miss is. that. It is a little uh, actually because it gives you like the whole racial stereotype of the Chinese wise man with the long fingertips. Yeah, I get. Uh, I mean, I just don't. Yeah, I don't see it as racist. I'm sorry. It's it's a stereotype. It's okay. it's goofy. We I mean, we don't have to agree on this. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess I just, my biggest thing is like when 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 you talk about this movie, um, I don't know. I just I've I guess I've read enough interviews or seen enough interviews and read enough articles that I could totally I can totally see this being a you know. A chance for this writer to come out and and write something that was edgy for 1985 and just put all of these crazy things in a film that nobody saw coming and um yeah i mean there's just enough evidence for me to tip the scale and say yeah sure yeah why not uh, hands down this is my favorite nightmare film yeah. 
Um, and I know you've you've told me very similar uh, things in chat that you also feel like this is the best one in the series. Is that is that still accurate? Yes, I I would have to say this is probably the best Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Uh, personally, I feel like the first one was kind of bad, and the the other one I saw was the one with her baby. That one was in, like her child was in her womb and Freddy was trying to convert him. That one was kind of bad. And yeah. then the uh, one where Nancy comes back and Robert England plays himself, who plays Freddy Krueger, but is also Freddy Krueger in the movie. That one was really bad. So I kind of, oh yeah, and Freddy versus Jason, that was also pretty bad. Um, but this one was actually pretty good. So yeah, best one in the series. Nice. Good. Yeah. Good. I like the remake though. I did like the remake. See, and that's something that's funny. It's like I watched. So the first time I watched the remake, were you just about to say that you know that I don't like it? Oh, what? You mean th this one? No, the remake. The remake? No, I know you hate it. Oh, well, I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't hate anything, first you, of all. You said, you said personally, you said, you know what, this is my least favorite movie. Anybody who's, who likes this movie is dumb. You're dumb <laughs> for liking it. Okay. And I no. started crying. No. I said I don't like where they took that one because, uh, to me... They went a little too deep in uh, his past, but um, like way too deep in my opinion. But I did rewatch it after you and I had that conversation because I was like, you know what? Maybe I gave it, you know, too little of credit. And I, I, I think I do like it more than I did the first time I watched it. Um, but it's still not my like top three for the Nightmare series. But anyways, back Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Let, let's talk more about this movie, because I think this one, uh, like you said as well, is is the best in the series. It stands out to me more than any of the others, and I really enjoyed um, the story, the acting. Um, I think the only thing I didn't like in this one was Freddy's actual makeup. Um, I didn't think he, he looked good. I think he looked great in the first one, and this is a way big step behind backwards for, for his makeup. In this film? Yeah. I honestly didn't... There wasn't really a whole lot of Freddy to look at in this one. So I don't... I don't feel too bad about it. Like You see Freddy a good amount, but not as much as I believe in the first one. Because no. this time... This time the main character is... Spoilers. He's Freddy. I, like, he kills... He, the, first, the first couple people who die are... Like, you, you'll see his, his coach die. He kills his coach... Which that scene was pretty cool. One of my favorite kills in the in the Friday in the Friday the Thirteenth series or <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street series. Jesus, dude. Clark, Clark Gaff. More 2020. Clark Gaffs. 2020. <laughs> More Gaffs. Anyhow, <laughs> yeah, that was like the you just see you can tell like they're pulling up on the uh, the jump rope, but he just gets pulled in and his clothes get ripped off, and this just really got me all all excited. And then he dies in the shower. Yeah, I, that that scene, I really like the effects, the practical effects, the ball shooting out into his face, uh, the you know just the absolute fear that you could tell he was starting to panic and had to go into like uh, Adventure Time Save Man type situation. You know, he drops to the ground. He's like a military guy. He's like ready to try and get out of there, uh, and then he just ends up so getting grabbed by the jump ropes. This is what I like about this movie, though. Like, because this allows me to kind of make up thoughts that are going through uh, the main character's mind right now. Because he looks over and he sees his coach, right? And his coach is being pulled up by Invisible Freddy. And he's in the shower and he's cognizant of this, this moment, this thing that's going on. And then he becomes Freddy. So I feel like... Me watching this and kind of looking into his mind is him going, yeah, fucking kill him, and him allowing Freddy to take control. Yeah, I, I also love the difference between most films that have a similar style, like, you know, possession and murder involved. This, this isn't, right. you don't see Jesse perform the act. You see Jesse watching somebody else perform the act. It's an out-of-body experience, which is really neat. And then he's it's covered not... in blood afterwards. <laughs> Well, they're showcasing, hey, it's not Jesse doing the killing. Right. 
it it somehow got up. possessed by by Freddy. It, we know it doesn't make any sense, but it, it's sleep, and we're gonna go with it. Yeah, and this just to just to piggyback, this is this takes place after he wakes up from his nightmare, and inexpli- uh, inexplicably walks into a leather bar <laughs> where his gym teacher is. Like, how awesome mm-hmm. is that? Yeah, and what is gym teachers wearing too? Like this is this is where I I kind of see the connotations coming in, like th- this scene and then the the shower death scene, and then him sleeping in with his newly found friend scene. I think a lot like, of the yeah. coach can can definitely point to those <clears throat> to those things because like when they're fighting, uh, and things they're... outside the writing control though, like. Dressing, the scene, where it's taking place. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, props still, yeah. Yeah. You know, my two things I lean on still are writing and props. Like, I think those two elements combined give way more to it than uh, just the acting. But anyways, yeah, th- yeah. what I was trying to get to is when JC, Jesse and Grady are fighting and Grady yeah. pulls down Jesse's pants and they're rolling around in the dirt and then the coach gets... <laughs> grabs them, pulls them up, and goes, assume the position! And they begin oh, yeah, doing yeah. push-ups for however long they're stuck outside. Like, these are just, That's also I mean, in the uh, Dead Poet Society, though. Assume the position. He gets paddled in the butt. I mean, it's it's not an uncommon thing. It's also not like a you... one, one single thing, though, that happened in yeah. a movie that changes my perception. It's just, it's a yeah. series of things that have happened that I go, I can see it. I'm giving in, and I understand that it could be this thing. Yes. It, so many things have fallen together in such a way that people can can definitely see it. I understand. Yeah. And Yes. But it's also, the, this, you know, Grady is my favorite character in the movie, just because he's that, like, I don't know, he's that arrogant um, jock kid that, you know, everyone usually hates, but somehow Jesse, the introvert type um who clearly doesn't fit in with anybody they're best friends somehow like that just in the 80s that wasn't a normal thing to me you know what i mean it was almost like a little bit of a breakfast club type feel where these people who don't actually get along and shouldn't get along start to get along and that goes for the three main characters you got jesse lisa and grady and then you have the slut too i guess the friend but i just i feel like in a normal world yeah, they are friends. Those are normal. We all gravitate towards each other now. But like back then, you had a lot of people putting each other in different boxes and groups. You know, the geeks, the freaks, the smart kids, the jocks, whatever. But this movie Is blew that all how that your, out of your the water. High school was? No, luckily I didn't. You, I didn't feel like that at all. In the, you grew up in Sixteen Candles. No, thank God. <laughs> I don't think any of us did. I think we all have unique uh, high school experiences, but I don't know. I don't know how this movie kind of portrayed anything besides that these two were just really good friends and whoever they were, they kind of grew up together and they had like a bond and a relationship, which I appreciated. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the best friend kind of is one of the people he kills and that's kind of what triggers the whole, this, this is what like everything kind of goes wrong right after the scene. Uh, Freddy starts killing people in the real world because their screams are all he needs to to show up. Technically souls, but yeah, screams equal souls, I guess, in a way. Well, the, the, whatever the book said when the the redhead was sharing it, it was like their screams were all he needed to come into the real world. Like he just like he thrives off fear. Yeah, which I guess is souls in the lore. I'm not so, sure. So so fear. Watched. So fear gives him power to trans, to like transcend from the dream world to our world, but actually killing and taking the soul is what makes him stronger. Okay. Um, later on in the movie, like I think the dream child or, or whichever one that is, um, the one that you hate, um, basically, which is go ahead, not untrue. Uh, basically. One of those is where you see all of the souls coming out of Freddy's body. I don't know if you've seen that one. Um, I, it's been forever. Yeah. So basically, they that one gets very religious, in my opinion. Right. And they exercise the demons inside of the demon. I don't. Uh, I don't know. It gets real crazy later on. But um, crazy, crazy. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just love this movie, damn it. I just love it. I don't know what no, to say it's, other it's than... A pretty uh, good, it's, a, it's a good slasher flick. I would, I would put this in... Uh... I'd put this on the list. I'd replace Nightmare on Elm Street with Nightmare on Elm Street 2. So just thing. just so you know, we released our top five slasher films. Yeah. And you did. uh and I I definitely think I need to rethink my order. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna replace it. Yeah, this is uh definitely is uh yeah, this is the best one. This is the best one I've seen of Nightmare on Elm Street. This, I mean, it doesn't give Freddy any value aside from him just being there. Like he just kind of comes, shows up, and he just kills people because hey, he wants he wants a body and he wants to kill people. All right. Yeah, they really try to go a different direction with this one and create something um, more terrifying in our world versus in a different like you know dream world. And I just don't I don't think it resonated well long term. But it was definitely great right. for this film. Definitely great. Oh, dude! I, I, what's your favorite scene in the movie? Um, I really like the bookends, the way they start the movie and the way they end the movie. It really like the opening to this movie always freaks me out. Just that true nightmare feeling of being on a bus and and your tormentor. In this case, it's Freddy taking control of the bus, actually driving the bus out into the middle of nowhere, and then you get killed. And then they bookend it with a very similar ending on the bus. But instead of everybody getting killed, they just have Freddy pop through the, the slut friend. And that's how they end the movie. I don't know. That's I would say that's my favorite scene. If you put those two together, the bookends, I, I really like that. Yeah. Well, it gives you the cliffhanger ending. Is, is this a dream? Another one of this kid's dreams, or is Freddy back again? Yeah. What, what's it, your favorite it's... scene? I... I... I'm unsure, really. Like... The scene in the, the shower, the gym, the gym shower scene, is probably the one that kind of portrays the most of like who this character is. And I kind of get a feel for him. And I actually, I, I, the kid becomes endearing to me. Like, I, I like him because I can kind of see emotion. I kind of see thoughts coming through his eyes. And even though he, the heroine isn't a very good actress, uh, there's, there's chemistry between the two of them to such a degree where you can tell, like, hey, she, this is her best friend or this is her boyfriend or whatever. And she actually gives a shit about him. Yeah. And I was like, that's, I want something like that in my life. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I support, I support the characters. I support the cast. Most horror movies, I don't. Yeah, most, most horror movies, you have a throwaway cast, right? That's what I like to call it, throwaway cast. They're just people there to get killed. You don't really care about them. Well, these character, I felt like these two characters had value, and then the friend had value as well. and The coach was kind of there, but he wasn't being a massive piece of garbage. So I don't know. This this was a pretty decent film. Aside from the dad, most of the characters were likable, but the dad being terrible to him made sense. I think they made him a good villain, um, but didn't use him in a proper way towards the end of the movie. Like, they could have had him come in for something more, I don't know, in a, in a way to try and stop Jesse and screw something up. I don't know. Just feels like they built up his, you know, his villainous, his villainy, and they didn't do anything with it. Maybe that's just me. I don't know, man. I, I, um, I'll, you know, aside from that, let's let's talk about fun facts and trivia about this film, then. Let's do it. So, fun fact number one: initially, New Line refused to give Robert England a raise, and they cast somebody else as Freddy. But after a few weeks of shooting, Robert Shea gave in to Robert's demands and gave him his job back. And the reason for that, in the interview at least, on Never Sleep Again is because the actor who was playing Freddy instead of England was just too stiff and not very, he wasn't Freddy-like is the way they kept putting it. It just wasn't the same. So they were really unhappy with it and had to get Robert England back, so they caved on his salary demands. 
Um, as we talked about, this is the only nightmare film in which uh, the lead character is a male. Um, Michael J. Fox was actually considered for the role of Jesse, but he was unable to due to his commitments to Back to the Future and Teen Wolf both coming out in 1985. Can you imagine having Michael J. Fox as the lead in this film? I could, yeah. I, I definitely can as well. I, I think they did a good job replacing him, though. Yeah, it's and it sounds like he was pretty close to actually doing it if he wasn't already in two other movies at the same time coming out at the same time. Um, because then there's also some more information about who was uh, who auditioned for the role. You had John uh, John Stamos, Christian Slater, and Brad Pitt, all who auditioned for the role of Jesse. And I couldn't see any of them playing Jesse, personally. You know, I'd, I'd be surprised with Brad Pitt. He has a pretty decent range, but I definitely think they'd pick the right Jesse. Yeah. Interesting enough, John Stamos played um, another role named Jesse in um, Full House. Uh, let's see. Tell me more about this Full House. <laughs> uh, I've never heard of it. It gets fuller, but oomch. Gets... That's a terrible joke. Uh, you get out of here. <clears throat> get the fuck out of here. Freddy's makeup was redesigned in this film from the first movie. Uh, in this movie, they went away from the pizza-like look that the uh, original creator made and moved more towards a Wicked Witch from the Wizard of Oz look, which is also funny because he does the whole scene flying in the window like the uh, Wicked Witch from Wizard of Oz, so that's always really interesting. Uh, this is the you missed only... the uh, pizza look? Sorry, what? Because you, you said it didn't look as good. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't like this at all. Yeah, I wanna I wanna kind of dig into that. Why Why do you not like it? So it look it just looks uh, kind of fake and and not to be too punny but cheesy. Um, it looks just Is it like the wrinkles that you don't like or yeah, it's just a bunch of melted cheese. There's no real texture mm -hmm. to it. It's just it's it's it just doesn't look the same to me. Uh, it looked wetter if that's a, if that's a good way to describe it, like slimier maybe. Um, but I really like the design of the first face, the way there's pits are kind of like the pepperonis on a cheese pizza, mm. on a pepperoni pizza, and the way that that's like his skin, um, and there's just spots and pockets of his skin that have just been burnt all the way down, and there's no flesh on top. It, it just looks more mm. grotesque to me than a bunch of just melted-looking skin over a burnt man's face. I just, I think the other one looks more realistic to me. Hmm. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, so the last two we kind of talked about a little bit, um, but we'll just rehash them to make sure uh, it's clear. This is the only film in the franchise where Freddy kills each of his victims outside of their dreams. Um, and then Freddy is only on screen for a total of 13 minutes in this film's 87-minute runtime. Yeah. I, I could tell that you did not see a whole lot of Freddy, and it didn't really bother me. Yeah, no. No, I think He's I think like, it was a good thing. <laughs> well, and they also made better decisions, I feel, in this one, too. Like, actually making the little girl who sings the Freddy. Like, they brought that back, but they did it with his sister instead, so it actually could relate to the story in some way. Yeah, very well done there. Yeah. I, uh, Curtis, would you watch this movie again on your own time? Yes, I probably will watch it in the next two weeks if uh, our listeners choose it in the poll. Oh, you're you're wishing, you're hoping for that, aren't you? I mean, I, I think uh, I love this movie. <laughs> I, I definitely, I was one of the ones who saw it was tied at some point, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, we got to make it wasn't tied, so I had to make it tie just to frustrate <laughs> you. Uh, no, I'm kidding, but uh, yeah, great film, loved it. Uh, we're going to do some plugs now, I guess, which if you haven't yet, folks, check out our Instagram and Twitter, which is going to be the number two guys horror pod. That is two guys horror pod. Curtis likes to set up a whole bunch of cool polls on Twitter, and he's made these lovely images of our top fives coming soon. Top five romantic comedies coming now, which they should actually that might already be out by the time I this show comes out. It might so, be. Oh, but it's if happening you have for sure. Always, if you always wanted to know what our top five uh, romantic comedies are, now's your chance, buddy. Now's your chance. 
Also, feel free to email us at any point in time. You gotta give us feedback at two guys and, ho and some horror at gmail.com. And that's just completely spelled out. So, um, it's two guys and some horror at gmail.com. But you know what? Curtis, do you want to lay out some words of appreciation for the lovely people who decided to listen to our podcast today? Heck yeah. We appreciate each and every single one of your faces. Um, we love seeing all the listeners that we get. Um, and, and we're really excited to just keep doing this and making content for you guys. Um, if you don't mind doing us a favor, though, and that's just following along on those social medias, um, whether it's just hitting the like button, whether it's voting on a poll, whether it's retweeting something, um, that helps us at least know that we're heading in the right direction. Um, yeah, and, and just keep downloading. You don't even have to listen. Downloads count. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Signs point to yes. <laughs> this is, is this how it's going to go the whole episode? Outlook good. <laughs>